welcome to the Dr. Music Podcast once again, where today I have Mr. Will Turpin with me. Uh, Will has been the basis for Collective Soul for more than 30 years, uh, where he's received ASCAP, BMI, Billboard Music Awards, tens of millions of albums sold, uh, tremendous chart success, of course, number ones, uh, multiple top 40, top 100 hits. Uh, Will and Collective Soul continue to celebrate the release of their latest record, Vibrating, and are ready to go back out on the road and uh will thanks for being here as always man yeah man great to see you again scott glad to be here bro thanks for your time too uh absolutely absolutely you know i got a note here hootie fest uh you know i just talked to sony uh uh, jim sonnefeld of course from from uh um they're a great bunch of dudes uh the cancun mexico for hootie fest uh you guys are on that bill that's ah man. I wish I could make that. I don't know. April twenty sixth to April 29th. Uh that's that's you. You did that before, didn't you? We haven't done Hootie Fest, and I think this is okay. the second second Hootie Fest. But it, I've seen the map, and I've seen uh, you know the schedule of events. It's it these uh these cool all inclusive destination festivals are really cool, and they're and they're 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 a popular thing right now. I think it kind of started with, with the boats. I think it started with our friend, sister Hazel. I remember sitting in a uh, people's pizza in Virginia Highlands in Atlanta when all the sister Hazel guys were still living in Atlanta. And they, they told me it was Ryan and Jeff. And they were like, yeah, man, we got this great idea. We got, we rented half of the boat. We're going to sell tickets for half the boat. And it's all fans and all bands for four days and five nights. And I was like, <laughs> it's a great idea. It is I had no idea it was going to turn into you know yep. we're probably on rock boat twenty something at this point. Uh, <laughs> but I remember before the first one went out, they told me that story. And it's just it's one of those stories where oh you won't believe what I heard before you know it's now these things are everyday everyday kind of things. Hootie Fest yep. four days in Cancun, shuttles taking everybody around, uh, oh, man. games competitions, stages all day every day all night. All the bands and friends that uh, that we know uh, that's a that's the other fun thing about these these festivals is uh you know between our buddies and gin blossoms and yeah Ubu dolls and all these band tonic all these bands we're we're friends back from to the 90s so it's it's right. actually fun for us to be able to socialize and be at a place for 4 days as well it's it's really cool yeah yeah oh man it's just you know i saw that and I, you know all these boats are are just a great great idea man uh it's just you know and uh you know these festivals of of like you said you guys get together and you get to spend some time together actually rather yeah. than you know, run in play run back yeah. out travel to the next city yeah. you know, yeah. uh so you get to to chill out and uh have a good time it's great man yeah. it's cool uh i i thought i heard ed say in an interview that you guys go to a house when you record. I see you in the studio here. Um, do you do you have you always recorded in a house uh, when you record? You know that you know the first time that, that we did that, and it's it's an era and a record that I just cherish. I, I cherish that time because I don't under don't understand how we were so just confident and driven to keep going. But the first time we went to a house was the Discipline Breakdown record. Uh, and it was by necessity. Um, we were locked, locked up tight, um, legally with the uh, lawsuit right. from our first, with, with our first manager, Atlantic records literally couldn't give us a dime to record. Couldn't even, couldn't even forward royalties. Um, so, you know, it's kind of built in, kind of baked into the name there, discipline breakdown. We were, the band was broke down a little bit just because everything was locked up, but man, we, we found a cabin in the woods near where we grew up in uh, McDonough, Georgia. And we, we brought in recording gear. We ripped out carpet and brought in recording gear. And we, we made a studio out of a, out of a cool home. And uh, it, it allows us to chill and not feel like we're on a clock and have our own space and do what we want to do. Um, and, uh, and, and, and again, that time period and, and what we did with discipline breakdowns is, is always going to be one of my favorite moments and favorite records but um but yeah now it's it's become a fun thing for us where it's a it's, it's a great time to we we basically call it destination recording uh vibrating 
uh, vibrating. Where, where was where did we do that? We were in New Jersey at Lake Hopticon doing some of that uh, in a in a really cool studio that was in a church, but we lived in a home right there on the lake. Um, and then this last one, like uh, the last one we just did was in Elvis's Palm, Palm Springs home. Uh, we set up in his old living room where the uh, RCA acoustic tiles were on the ceiling where he had, he had actually recorded some vocals there. Um, wow. But we set up in there, man. And yeah, today's technology, we, we, we bring a lot of gear. It's in big racks and has big wheels and stuff. We roll it in, but uh, yeah, we can just, we can do destination recording and it just separates you from the rest of the, the, you know, the rest of your life. And then you can kind of, you can definitely dig in and focus on, uh, on the music. Yeah. That's great, man. Um, you know, and your I mean the production is always like super tight. Those those riffs are just cutting, you know. Uh everything is just but there's a little bit of air and I and you know, there's you know, it's it's comfortable, it breathes uh yeah. too at the same time. Uh this record even more so, I think. I feel it uh you know like take uh you know you have and calling for that groove for from johnny and you know the rest of the guys to come in in the beginning on the open mic uh that kind of thing uh conversation with you can almost hear the room uh there's a cool kind of breathing to this record mm -hmm. uh was that intentional uh or you know just something that happened yeah. i love the way you explain that yeah um that's i, th I think that's ultimately what we want a listener to feel like like yeah we're crisp and we're tight and we're hitting you hard here but it's not mechanical and it's not right you know, delivered on a finite you know set of uh variables where it's like you know too mechanical uh yeah, yeah it's got to have life it's got to breathe it's got to have a soul it's got to have a little heartbeat to it too you know right. And it does, man. I mean, it's it always does. Uh that's what I'm saying. It's you know how you can get that hard hitting cutting edge kind of you know, just sharp riff and, and, you know, that pop on the drums and, and all of that, you know, just really sharp, but still have an organic feel to it. It's not sterile, you know? Yeah. Uh, thanks, man. Yeah, that's, it's just awesome. Um, I, I think about collective soul and I think about all that popularity really with the songs. Um, but you know, I, I somehow you guys seem to, fly under the rate you can go grocery shopping and nobody thinks twice about it right um you know that's a that's a thing uh <laughs> that's pretty cool uh it's great for you um uh, but uh, you know I, I everybody knows collective soul um you know i i hear it when i go grocery shopping and i hear it and uh, everywhere um but if i show somebody a picture of the band they probably, you know, nine out of 10 people might not be able to tell me who it is. Uh, you know, that's, I think it's a pretty cool thing for, <laughs> especially for you. What What are your feelings about something like that? You know, do you wish sometimes there was a little more popularity, uh, you know, the, not the personalities, the actual personalities of the band? Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean. It's a little bit, it's a good, you know, it's a good point. It's a little bit of an anomaly as far as Collective Soul to have the, the musical success, you know, we're ba you'd basically have to be under a rock for some of these songs not to be part of your your life and your memories, you know. Yeah. Uh, um, but I, you know, I, I remember, I remember us being 24, 25. Ed would have been 29, 30 years old early on, and I remember us saying, "We want to be known for our music, <laughs> not for the individuals in the band." There and, you go. Well, we did. We sure did that. <laughs> it's great man it's yeah great. but you're right and, and and the people who do recognize me the fans who do recognize us they're such fans that it's a ple it's always a pleasant uh exchange or they're actually really friends and they actually really know me yeah right right <laughs> right, right but that is that's so true uh you know the hardcore fans will know you right away uh which is great i mean that's you know it's kind of a, a filtering process almost you know <laughs> yeah yeah that's cool um it's been said that you guys, when December came in, um, you know, Ed bringing in the music, uh, that's kind of the, the, the you know, I want to go through that process a little, uh, how it actually works for you. But, you know, he brings in December and you guys hated it, didn't like it. This is the thing. Um, you know, was that was that the case? Yeah, no, that wasn't the case. No, no, no. Okay. Um, 
that story, you know how stories are, right? By the right. time they go around the campfire, even if you're sitting at one campfire, <laughs> by the time it gets back around to you, the story's a lot different. <laughs> right. But there, there is some truth uh, to that story. The truth of that story is we love the song. It's it's basically a um, it's a it's it's a round or a loop. You know, it's 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 the same chord progression over and over, but we introduce different right. melodies. And I to me, that's always super interesting and super fun. Mm-hmm. The the uh, the story started because. Um, Atlantic and Ed also wanted it to be the first single. And I was, I, it's not, I, nobody disliked the song, but I was like, oh no, this can't be the first single. I literally right. thought just that was a bad decision, but no one hated that song. Everybody loved that song. Okay. Yeah. As, as you should, uh, it's just an amazing song. Um, yeah. Tell well, me I was you- wrong. It, it was definitely a great first single. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, you guys are, you, you can't miss. I am really, I mean, these songs are just great. The band's great. And um, tell me the process though. You know, Ed, Ed comes in, does he have scratch vocals on it? Does he, uh, you know, how finished is it? Is it an idea? Um, you know, and, and what do you guys contribute to, to that? All of those things. I mean, it, and it depends on, on the song and it also depends on the era, you know, in, in the early days, there was a lot more, ideas coming from straight jamming uh and we still do that a lot but ed will bring in some some pretty focused songs now compared to where it was in the other days uh but um it just depends i mean i remember when he bought in run you know for dosage yeah Yeah, he had that song in his head where exactly where we were going to go with it um and then there's songs like heavy where you know uh and same same record uh where it just started with basically started with a rhythm section thing me and Shane were doing and Ed came in the room said keep doing that you know and 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 then that song evolved but uh you know it's Ed, Ed's a prolific writer man certainly obviously one of the one wow. of the reasons why people know collective souls music is is, is the strength of Ed's writing um man it just depends on the song i mean we you know we're we're kind of like we're kind of a self-produced band as well. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on production wise that it's not, it's not a, it's not something we, we understand how we do it and what we, and how we get to the end point, but you know, it's not something you can clearly define and tell people how it all works. But um, yeah, it's just all, <laughs> it's all encompassing, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, I mean, and it's great to see that progression too. Uh, uh, you know how it works for you guys. Yeah. And, you know, just, just uh, you, you go with what works. It's cool. And, and for the most part, if, if I have to say what my definite, what I feel like my definite role is, especially in the early part of trying to support and create a song, it's definitely like trying to figure out the 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 overall rhythmic rhythmical vibe transitions into verse to chorus. How are me and Johnny going to set the table for everybody else? That's where my focus starts on a song. And then and then all these songs evolve and we all have different ideas that come in. Yeah. And and that's, you know, that's a band. Uh that's what it's all about, right? Um, the half and half EP. Uh where were songs where did they come from? Um, back again. It's the only song that that was brought forward to to vibrating. Right. Um, why is that? Is that a you know was that guy a little bit special to you guys? Um, you know, tell me a little bit about the half and half uh, EP and and that deal. Yeah, uh, we know we just we still have to create, man. We so we still and and again, uh, Ed's creative ideas are just they just don't stop, man. So <laughs> that was just more like a we didn't want to do a whole album. We just thought let's release an EP uh, and get some vinyl out for record store day. And we wow. had a song and, and we thought, let's do some cover tunes and yep. it was just a creative idea and we need creative outlets. So, uh, you know, and, and we recorded our friend's studio in Atlanta, Madison studio. So we yep. had fun. That's cool. Yeah. And it came at a, a really horrific time <laughs> in uh, the COVID thing. Right. Too. So, uh, yeah, it was cool that, you know, anybody was putting out anything at that point or, you know, getting together or, you know, did you guys get together uh, with that? Yeah, absolutely. We did. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. And we were COVID responsible, I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> a little asterisk there. Uh, <laughs> I officially had it twice, so I don't know. I don't Seriously. know if I did it right or wrong, but I I, I I survived it. You know. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, 
ever been a time you you felt like you wanted to contribute more you know ed's ed's writing is just uh it's a dominating thing and it's a you know it's a successful thing for you it works um you know because you're a solo artist as well you know you write your own music um has there ever yeah ever feel restricted to bring anything in i don't um that's great. But just keeping up with Ed's prolific stuff, I don't ever have that thought where boy collective soul needs another song. I better write one. That doesn't <laughs> cross my mind. I, guy, I really man. do cherish and love how I or how we do it as a band. I really do cherish and love that. Um and we all feel we all are fulfilled by the by the process. Um that being said, yeah, there's other songs, you know, like uh I started off on piano. I, I playing bass, I still see a piano in my head, you know, so I, I have a lot of stuff that comes out of me that's kind of more piano based, maybe a little more, um, uh, you know, maybe a little more uh, rhythmical kind of funky uh, Americana vibe too than Collective Soul is, you know, mm -hmm. so a lot of that stuff comes out and I like to put that maybe on side projects or, you know, my solo records, like you mentioned. Right, right. And last one was Serengeti Drivers, right? Yeah, man. Yeah, uh, that was a long time ago, man. Uh, yeah, we're going on five years now. Uh -oh. Yeah, where where's the next one? Are, are you working on something? I get that question a lot, and I'm glad because that means they, somebody actually wants to hear it. Absolutely. Yeah, oh. man. I, I've got some really good songs lined up. I'm busy producing a lot of people right now, so uh, yeah. I'm trying to. You know, I'm really enjoying working with other people. Um, and producing right now, but I am certainly lining up the songs and getting ready to. I'm thinking maybe tour all summer, and as soon as I get back in here in the fall, one of the things on the short list is going to have to be some more solo stuff. Maybe not a full record. It takes a lot, uh, yeah. and I'm producing a lot now, uh, and I wasn't yeah. in the Serengeti era. But uh, I would love, yeah, we need at least another four or five song release. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be great, man. Uh, you say you're producing. Um, I just got a message from my editor, Melody Kaiser. Uh, hey, Dreamer. Uh, yeah. He produced that record. Uh, yeah, man. He loves it, man. Uh, oh, great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. That's very cool. Uh, you, you know, you're busy, and that's great, man. Um, got yeah. uh, I got this mix up right now. Odd Army out of um, California, man. Those guys came here. They were uh, they were here for three weeks. They got a great record coming out this summer. Yeah. Um, the good. Summit out of Ohio. I guess I got some good good musicians, good friends that are uh, trusting me with their with their little babies. That's great, man. And that's that really, I mean, that says a lot, uh, you know, because it is their baby and they, and they, you know, I'm sure that, you know, they're protecting that and, you know, they, they, they want that nurtured and yeah, uh, red, uh, another one you and your uh, editor should check out red and the revelers out of mobile, Alabama. Cool. Uh, we're, we're releasing some hot singles for them. Their record will be out this summer too, man. Good fun stuff, man. Good. Yeah. fun. Awesome, man. I, that's great news, man. Uh, and it's, are you still doing gooey, gooey records, right? Yeah. Gooey music is a yeah. production company. Uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, man. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Um, you know, I just watched the Woodstock 99. I got to ask you about this, the Woodstock 99 documentary and, and it's a, basically a horror movie. Uh, <laughs> um, it's pretty frightening, man. Um, and, but I hear a lot from a lot of bands that were there that they, you know, they kind of played and, and got out and they had other things to do or, you know, another city to go to. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your memories of that? Uh, you know, of course, Woodstock 99 for people that don't know was a catastrophe and they burned it down and everything else at the end. Um, you guys played that festival. We did. Uh, and that was like the, the interesting perspective with a handful of bands, us being one of them is that we played Woodstock 94. Right. And we played Woodstock 99. Yep. Same promoters. Yep. Buddy. <laughs> They screwed up the second one. It was tangible the the day that we pulled into the festival. I was like, "We're on, we're on, we're in a tarmac here. This is a this is a cement landing strip, and it just felt stale, hot." I can't. I mean, within within an hour or two, I'm hearing from people, "Yeah, they're charging us four bucks for water. Couldn't even bring water in." And you heard those stories yep. on the ground when you walked in there, and. Of course, we get on stage. You can watch our set. Crowd loves the set. Fine. But when you compare it to 94, it's like 94 was, even with the mud, 94 was a, that was a great music festival. 
99, they, they, they really screwed it up when they monetized it and they stuck everybody on top of a, a tarmac and, uh, it was tangible in the day, uh, when we were there. I'm just, that's all, basically all I can say about it. It was tangible that they had done something really wrong compared to what they did in 94. Yeah. 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 Were you there for all the, the end? No, you, just like you said, um, <laughs> we keep schedules, so we were there for one day and then and then out. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> it's a good thing. <laughs> uh, I, I saw the Jewel interview. We were right. We were there that same day that she was there. We were right next door to her, both on Atlantic Records at that time. So we, I remember seeing her that day and stuff. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it's it was frightening, man. Um, how do you guys choose a set list now? Uh, you know, last time I saw you, you know, the blood, the blood thing, you played six tunes from that album. I love that record. I think it's one of your better records, actually. Um, you, what do you do now? <laughs> I mean, it's getting harder. You're screwed. Harder. You are screwed, man. I mean, you, yeah, you got to play you know, like a bulk of the hits, but the bulk <laughs> of the hits is like an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. Uh, I can't imagine what you guys do, how you do that. Uh, you know, what's a set list like for you? It's a, it's a obviously an awesome problem to have. It uh, is. Man, we just you know we just we just try to create the the ups and downs and make sure that that the ride is is strong and and without you know without um, without leaving out too many of the things that you know it's 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 really hard because what happens with this with the music is these songs mean so much to people right and it's hard for us to choose and, and, and it, it's impossible. I should say it's impossible for us to get everybody happy with the set list. Uh, yeah. But again, a good problem to have. Uh, we just try to keep the energy in the room the right way. Uh, we're going to play the bangers, yeah. uh, but we're also going to get off on some new stuff and, and we're kind of known for sometimes playing the songs you have never heard, you know? So <laughs> And that's fun, man. I mean, yeah. that is fun. Uh, you know, to hear the, the the hits and it's great. Of course, you want that. Uh, but I'd love to hear you know something deeper. You know, uh, yeah, it's it's really cool. You know, stuff like discipline break the discipline breakdown record. You know, there's a lot that doesn't get played, and that's another. Right. You know, I love that record, full right. circle and stuff like that. Yeah, and, man, full circle. We never we've never played live one time, but what a great song, man! What oh, it's song. just unbelievable, man. You know, and the horns and stuff. It would be difficult. The Memphis horns, man. What? Yeah, I, ah. I'm fond of that record. So uh, yeah. yeah, keep talking about it. Man. Yeah, <laughs> totally, man. I mean, it'd be cool to hear some of that stuff uh you're you're of course you know your image uh that red music man bongo five uh yeah. that's you know that's part of will turpin it's underneath the screen there i'm sure somewhere right <laughs> you know it's it's part of you uh your midsection there um is that what we hear on the record you know i don't think i've ever seen you with anything else uh, yeah that's a good question uh so our relationship especially my relationship with music man Ernie Ball, it's been awesome. It's been one of the, the coolest, longest relationships I've had doing this. Matter of fact, the artist rep is Derek Brooks, who worked at a place called Tape Warehouse in the 80s in Atlanta. Uh, he remembers me every now and then driving up to get two-inch tape. He, he definitely remembers Ed, uh, who would have been head engineer, going to get two-inch tape uh, every now and then. And he, and he knew my father. He's one of those people that knew my father from way back when. But... um they had that bongo bass, new model. And Derek said, what do you think about possibly being our guy that plays the bongo bass? You know, nobody knows about this thing. And uh, they sent me one. And uh, it's really, really solid piece of gear. It plays smooth. It sounds equal. Anywhere on the neck, it sounds equal. I love using the five string because I can, you know, play some different different notes here on the on the low one. But, uh, uh, yeah, man, so when they made me that custom red sparkle, it's kind of just – become kind of become my rig you know and it's uh so pretty be out again this summer they're, they they did they are making me one more new one this year i, I found out that uh cool but uh man they're they're great uh but good question as far as what's on the record uh if you had to if i had to say collective soul records there is some stingrays there's i, I don't pull out the bongo much because it kind of stays with what I call our pod, you know, our pod that goes from stage to stage stays together. I don't take my bass home, you know, it's, it stays there. So, yeah. um, 
I've got a bongo bass here at the studio and we definitely use it. But um like uh yeah, here's here's one of my relics right here. This uh let's see if I can get that. Is that a bass? Is that a bass right there? Uh, yeah. it looks like a fender like a, a sunburst. Yeah, man, that's a that's my that's my dad's there it is right there. I see it. Uh that's my bass, but that's a that's a sixty five jazz. Um and there's a lot of precision on the collective soul records. And there's even one PRS bass that made a lot of a lot of uh compare me and me and Sean are uh our longtime engineer co-producer. You know, we'd have the shootouts and that PRS bolt on neck that Paul Reed gave me uh in the late nineties, that thing is on it is on some good collective soul records. Uh, you know, short scale too. Don't let the short scale fool you sometimes, man. It doesn't mean it's not gonna roar, you know. Right. Right. But, uh, yeah, mainly precisions, jazz. Uh, I Ed's got a rick I've used for a while, uh, but you can tell when I'm on the rick. It's it's got a special sound. Uh, yeah. But mainly mainly precisions and and stingrays, and that PR that little PRS bass. It's right over there somewhere. But PRS bass, man. You know, I see a lot of PRS guitars, and and Howard Lee's a friend of mine. Uh, you know, he. Uh, I, of course, you know, with heart and, and stuff, you know, PR, PRS is his go-to um, and they're beautiful guitars. And, you know, I, I, and Carlos Santana, of course, you know, I always see the guitars. Don't rarely see a PRS bass. He did officially release some PRS basses, so they're out there. But this particular one that he gave me has a little handwritten serial number and he never even released that model, whatever that was. It's yeah. just a bolt on short scale. It never really even got released, but that, you know, that's a good relic too, because Paul Reed actually gave me that. So, yeah. 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 That's awesome. That's awesome. What a, what a maker right there, man. Uh, yeah, man. He's, yeah. He's, he's incredible. Um, last time I asked you about a bucket list, uh, you said uh, you want your sons to record and be in a band. Uh, your sons are older now. Uh, that's a, is, is that a thing for them? Are they taking that path? Yeah, man. Uh, Tristan's 25. He's here in the studio a decent amount with me. Uh, cool. And he's been playing actually with uh, Luke on drums and Luke is 17. So uh, funny enough at the 17 year old, I think is kind of driving the 25 year old and telling him we got to, we got to get to work on this. Let's go, let's go, let's go. That's cool. So they're out playing live a lot, but uh, they will also have something recorded by the fall as well. Yeah. Ah, oh, man, that's so great to hear, man, because I know that, you know, it's important to you. Uh, you know, that, that, you know, it, it might, it means a lot. Uh, it does mean a lot. It, it's, it's good. Uh, legacy. Obviously it started with my father, but right. it's great legacy. And, uh, you know, I try not to have rose colored glasses. I'm impressed by Tristan and, and what he writes and, and how he performs. I'm, I'm super impressed by him. So I, I want to support him and I'd, I'd love to see him, uh, Get some of his songs out there. He writes great music. Ah, uh, that's great. I can't wait to hear uh, some of it, man. That's that's cool. Uh, you got tour dates all over the place. Early October. Uh, you're getting a little older. Uh, <laughs> kids are growing up a bit now. Uh, so you know, uh, you don't have little ones that you know. Uh, they're that's why I'm of... here in the studio more now. I get to produce more. Yeah, yeah. It's it's pretty cool. Um, is it touring easier now, or is it uh, is it more difficult? We, we've, uh, you know, it's been so consistent in our career. We've, uh, we, you know, it's what, it's a blessing, you know, it's a blessing, but it's also like, it's just like anything that you do. That's a, that that's a job at some point. It really, you know, it, it does come down to a job. So yeah, um, we're blessed, but sure, man. I mean, dude, you, you talk to us about two and a half weeks in of a three week solid run where we're not even going home and we're playing five nights a week. It's just going to be like, Yep. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the moments on stage clearly trump anything that goes on during the day. But during the day, yeah, it, obviously it's going to get monotonous and it's going to get a little the grind, so to speak. Uh, but oh, yeah. it, you can't. I can't. I'd be totally remiss not to tell you how blessed we are to be able to do that. You know, yeah. and yeah. and to be honest with you, even that bus bunk, yeah. it's my little. Oh, happy place, man. I, I love that little, I love that bunk. I, I know how to feel comfortable in those things now. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Uh, you know, I, I did like four, four nights in a row with uh, Michael Shanker and uh, Images of Eden on, on the tour as a photographer. Um, 
I, I was exhausted, man. The bunk and didn't I, work for you? <laughs> I mean, it was unbelievable. I didn't have the bunk, but, you know, I mean, these were, you know, one was a four and a half hour drive or something. Uh, the other ones were like an hour or two uh, to each one, but it was night after night, man. Yeah. I mean, it was, I get home, you know, I, I put the photos in and then I wake up and I start to get ready for the next show. And it's like, yeah. I, you know, I, I, and I'm not even playing, you know what I mean? It's like, I can't imagine, you know, uh, I think a lot of people look past that grueling uh, discipline of touring. Yeah, because they only see you that one night in their town. Right, <laughs> right. And then you go play games and stuff for the rest of the time, right? And then by the time we're wired up, we're up till three or four in the morning. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's a good thing. But you, you should, yeah. yeah, when you're in the middle of the grind, man, we during the day, there's a, there's a lot of... Uh, getting yeah. up for a couple hours and going right back to sleep you know yeah totally man <laughs> it's great uh it is a great thing you guys uh popular as ever man uh hit after hit uh ed tells me there's two more records in the can is that yeah true? man uh the one that uh, i was telling you about that we did in palm springs that was just right, now right. Complete. uh and there was one before that that's a great record uh so i hope that's out late summer i'm not i haven't got the latest on that but the the record we did in palm springs will be out next year with the quintessential collective soul documentary will be out next year too so look really? forward to it man. oh yeah next wow. year 2024 you should hopefully you won't get tired of hearing about us but you're going to hear a lot about collective soul next year <laughs> great man and learn more man even even the people that know the story i think the documentary will be pretty yeah. eye-opening for them <sighs> That's just awesome. Now, are we talking about um, DVD, Blu-ray kind of thing, or a theater thing? Uh, I'm sure that I'm sure there'll be some options to to buy it, but no, uh, more uh, streaming service. You know, it'll, it'll be a, right. it'll be one of the, one of the streaming services. You know, and it, hopefully it'll hopefully it'll pop right up on the top ten in America kind of thing. You know? Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, that's just awesome, man. That's great news. Great news, man. Hey, I want to let you go. Uh, you know, I know you got stuff to do there, obviously. Uh, bands to produce, uh, all kinds of things in your life going on. That's so great, man. Will, always a pleasure, man. Uh, Cheers, Scott. Yeah, man. Great talk to you, man. You too, man. We got to do that. Thanks for the support this... over the years, buddy. Huh? Thanks for the support over the years, man. Oh, absolutely, man. Absolutely. And we got to we gotta do that disc golf, too, one of these days, man. <laughs> Speaking of getting old, I can't, I can't, I can't throw, it. I can't drive it this way anymore. I have to drive it this way. The elbow, yep, the elbow just ain't the same. But same here, man. Same here. Uh, it's too cool. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's great growing old with you, man. Uh, and, and keep doing what you do, and we'll be looking for those bands coming out of uh, out of your studio. And yeah, uh, man, real people music, man. Yeah. Dude, there's some good bands coming out, man. That's cool. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll keep in touch. Uh, and right, I'll see you on the road. All right, man. Yeah, come see us, bro. Absolutely. All Later, right, man. Take care, Will. Bye.